Well, good afternoon. Um, so this week, as I mentioned, we had our first sermon discussion group, and um, we were talking about this covenant that God makes with Abram. And I just want to say in appreciation that it gave me a lot to think about uh, and to build from for the sermon. So thank you to the folks who were there Wednesday. And if it's a really bad sermon, it's not their fault. Okay? <laughs> Let's have a prayer. Amazing and, wonder- and powerful God, bless our listening. When we meet you in our day-to-day lives, give us grace to know you. When we meet you in the power and majesty of nature, give us peace and gratitude. When we meet you in mysterious experiences, give us courage. We pray in the name of the one who came to meet us, Jesus. So, Downton Abbey's third season ended last Sunday. And if you haven't seen the show, and you're not obsessed with it like I am, one of the key problems it keeps coming back to is this. Who will be the heir? The name of the show, after all, comes from the estate and the huge mansion that sits on it. The house was built around and incorporates an old abbey, so that's where the name comes from, Downton Abbey. And it also suggests how big it is, since a house for 15 or 20 nuns was not large enough for a single family and needed some wraparounds and a few extra floors of space. And this property and the role of own, owner and lord and protector has been passed down in the family for hundreds of years from father to first son. Unless, that is, there is no first son, which kicks into gear hours of PBS intrigue when a new heir must be found among distant relatives and then integrated into this particular way of life. So our story today, then, is basically Downton Abbey for 1500 B.C. Abraham, uh, I'm sorry, Abram, this is before he becomes Abraham, Abram has no children. He and his wife haven't been able to have any children, and it's been so long that their biological clocks aren't really even ticking it anymore. It's been a while. So even though Abram is a righteous and, self- and well-respected man with lots of herds and servants and wealth to his name, it doesn't mean that much because of that constant question, who will be the heir? The stakes are pretty high in Abram's relationship with the Lord. Excuse me. Mm. Thank you. This is a good place to sneeze, isn't it? All right. He has left home and wandered in foreign lands for many years, per the Lord's instructions. He's wealthy, but like I said, not content. In today's episode of Desert Abbey, he hears the Lord's voice speaking, saying, Count the stars. That's how many descendants you'll have. And then the Lord takes him on a walk of the territory, promising your descendants will have all this to live on as their own. Which does and doesn't answer that prime question, who will be the heir? Because it's pretty much impossible for zero children to turn into thousands of great-great-grandchildren, at least if you are planning to be physically related to them, as Abram wants to be. So the next part of the conversation is that Abram believes the Lord, who appreciates that and considers it yet another example of what a good guy Abram is. But it's hard for Abram to leave it at that. He wants proof. Which brings us to the least Downton Abbey-like part of the story, which is Abram sacrificing three large animals and two birds and then waiting around and chasing away buzzards while he waits for the Lord to do something. He's waiting for the Lord to do something that will reassure him about the answer to his burning question. This is an expensive sacrifice, and if you're wondering what the animal is being cut in half is about, it's related to a method of fortune-telling used at that time. Kind of like gazing into a crystal ball, or reading someone's palm, uh, but a lot messier. But there's also a way in which this is a gift the Lord asks for, as something to seal the covenant about to be made, a sort of good faith gesture before the two parties sit down to sign an agreement. So as the sun is going down and Abram is hanging out with the sacrifices, the Lord shows up in a big way. First, Abram hears his fortune told. So let's see. You'll have lots of descendants, but oh, it looks like they'll be enslaved for... 400 years, but then after that, they'll escape with a lot of wealth from the people who enslaved them, and it looks like I punish their oppressors pretty, oppressors pretty harshly. There you go, right? So that's the fortune. 
And then comes the covenant. And I joke a little bit about Abraham having his palm read. But this is a serious moment. In this moment, the eternal creator, the living and unlimited almighty God, makes a binding covenant to one person, Abram. And that's what the smoking fire pot and the torch are about. The Lord is represented by smoke and fire. And by walking between the animals, the Lord promises to Abram the gift of this land and the children to live in it. So what should we do with this story? Well, first off, this experience of Abram's might be a comfort or a warning to those of us who are hungering to hear a clear answer to our own burning question. Maybe it's better not to know, right? It must be overwhelming, to say the least, to hear, yes, you'll have that child you long for, uh, and then your descendants will be slaves for 400 years. Oh, And the truth is that an answer, an encounter like this one with the living God, can be an overwhelming thing, a powerful and dazzling mystery. In this moment, as God takes an important step in a plan to save the whole world, that Almighty Lord appears as smoke and fire, full of energy, consuming and dangerous, and yet choosing to be contained in a pot, in a torch, and in a covenant, his promise to Abram. Just recently I read a book called Proof of Heaven by Eben Alexander. In the book he tells the story of a dramatic near-death experience that brought him into the presence of the source of all creation. And the story is amazing and comforting, explains a lot of things, but in some ways, for me, I don't feel like I can trust it. It seems too clear, it's too easy, it's too laid out. And yet, it could be that I'm forgetting the terrible price that comes with this vision. A week spent with his brain's higher functions shut down, and an encounter with a disease that really should have killed him, followed by months of recovery. Smoke and fire. Indeed. This covenant that Abram receives is not just for him. Abram does go on to have a son, miraculously, through his wife Sarah. And that son, Isaac, has children of his own, and they have children. And then after a few generations, this family does become a people who suffer under slavery in Egypt. And then they return to the land promised to Abram, just as the Lord had said. And then, many years after that, God arrives again. This time contained not just in a pot or a torch, but in the fragile body of a peasant girl's baby, one of Abram's thousands upon thousands of descendants. And in that person of Jesus, God begins a new covenant for the whole world. And Jesus brought that good news of a new way to live, marked by love and justice, and he made that new covenant in his death and resurrection before any of us were ever born. And all there is for us to do is to accept that great love and to follow. Because if the question is, who will be the heir? The answer is that we are all the heirs of the promise, of the way, and of the kingdom. Thanks be to God. Amen.